Welcome back to part three, everybody. So now we're talking about a bit more of a white box approach um, and specifically solution space sampling and also um, some other techniques um, that could be used with uh, combinatorial interaction testing. So, but again, first small reminder on uh, what is actually white box testing. So as opposed to black box testing. So yeah, when you remember black box testing, we said we ignore all the source code, even if it's available. And now we, um, we consider the actual source code or the, uh, in case of our product lines, the um, implementation artifacts. So what can we do now when we uh, choose to consider the uh, source code? So of course we can look at the inner structure um, of any subject that we want to test. Uh, we can look at the control flow and the data flow and then from um, these information, we can derive test cases, yeah, which are more specific. Maybe we want to test every uh, control flow um, that is actually possible in our uh, in our um, software product, um, or we want to see uh, how our system handles different uh, data, and so on. Um, so there are, of course, different coverage criteria that I can consider with white box testing. Uh, one really simple one is statement coverage, so which says, okay. Uh, I want to design my test cases uh, such a way that all statements that I have in my program are at least executed once. Yeah? So of course they can be uh, um, executed many times, but um, there's no statement in my, um, in my product that is not executed at all, right? So this would be something that is bad because then I don't have the chance to test uh, this, this statement at all yeah? when it's never executed. Okay, this is something I can do, but often this isn't enough. Um, so it doesn't detect all of the faults. And so this is something uh, we can uh, build upon. And another thing that we could consider as a coverage criteria is branching coverage. So there, uh, we not only want to um, cover all the statements, yeah, this is a part of it, but we also want to look at branching statements. So like ifs and loops and uh, jumps and other things that uh, somehow, um, yeah, um, have an influence on the control flow in our program. And when the control flow branches at some point, we want to make sure that we take every branch. Um, so um, maybe we want to skip some statements at some point um, because uh, there's an if statement or something like this. And we want to make sure that uh, we go inside the if statement. We want to go uh, make sure that we go in the else branch of the if statement. And we want to, uh, if there's no else branch, we want to skip the statement um, altogether. Yeah, so this is something that uh, we're now considering with branching coverage. And as you can imagine, this of course requires more test cases than just statement coverage. And on top of that, um, we have something like term coverage, which not only considers the branching coverage, but also all the terms that are used in the condition of the, um, of the you know, control uh, mechanism. So when we have an if statement, there's uh, some condition inside and we consider all the different terms that we have uh, here and all the different uh, outcomes these uh, or values these terms can take. And then we want to make sure that all the terms have all the different uh, values and that all of them are tested. And as you can imagine, this is again really, uh, really complex because um, it again grows exponentially. And so an exhaustive term coverage is uh, most of the time uh, not really uh, desirable, but we can have uh, something like a simplified uh, term coverage, uh, which achieves more than a branching coverage, but less than a full term coverage, which is mostly not feasible. Yeah, um, if you think of a loop, for example, it's always it's not always possible to run all different uh, uh, loops. So. Uh, uh, going into the loop never, going into loop once, twice, thrice, and so on. Uh, this is uh, most of the time not possible. And so maybe we just want to execute the loop never, once, and twice. Yeah? And this is maybe enough. Yeah? So this is something we could achieve with uh, term coverage. Okay, so now how can we uh, somehow use this um, new information when we consider the implementation artifacts uh, inside a product line yeah, for product line testing? And here I have a small example. So. Um, is a really a small code example for a, a small product line. And um, there are two bugs inside um, this uh, small code snippet. And if you want to find them yourself, of course, you can now pause the video, have a look for yourself, and I will uh, just give you the answer in a few seconds. So oh, maybe I give you the chance to see it on a big screen. And now what's, uh, what's the first problem? So the first problem is something we can find when we uh, compile the right uh, product. So or, 
the product with the right configuration. So if we have a configuration that includes the um, feature FIFO, uh, but not the feature directed call, we can see that um, in line uh, 29, um, there's a field uh, DREC, yeah, which is um, which is used, yeah, and it should be defined uh, in a different line in line uh, number eight, yeah, but line number eight is not executed because of the configuration. And so when we used um, this variable in line 29, it's simply not declared. And so we would run into a problem here. Yeah? Another problem would be an output exception in line eight. Um, so when we have a different configuration, which is directed call is selected and FIFO is not selected, um, then uh, we actually uh, would run into a null pointer exception here um, because uh, the parameter is null uh, in line eight. And of course, we don't have this problem in every configuration, just the configuration that um, has this specific, um, this specific feature interaction. So, and we already talked about feature interactions yeah, and about pairwise coverage. And so we know for both of these problems, we would actually find um, the problem. Yeah, so when we have a pairwise sample, we can create configurations and some configuration that we create will have the combination FIFO and not directed call and some configuration will have the combination directed call and not FIFO. And when we execute these configurations or the products derived from these configurations with the right test cases and these specific lines are executed, then we will run into exactly these problems and uh, we would find them. But as it turns out, when you look at uh, real world product lines, these uh, presence conditions that you have for each line, so under uh, which condition a line is present in a product or not, these can of course be more complex. Yeah? These don't have to be uh, pairwise combinations, it's gonna be of course three-wise, four-wise combinations and so on. And as we learned, we uh, don't want to go um, that high on a specific T, so even for T equals five, T equals six and so on, um, we already end up with really large uh, samples. So this is something we want to avoid, yeah? just creating such large samples. And now when we look at the source code, um, maybe uh, we, want to, um, yeah, we want to be a bit more clever about creating our configurations such that we find uh, these, exactly, um, yeah, uh, these exactly problems. Yeah? Which just looking at the source code and deriving the right configurations would always just creating all the configurations for um, t equals five, t equals six and so on. So, and here's the idea um, of what could we do about these problems. Um, so we could look when we have a product line that uses if dev blocks, for example, as a variability mechanisms, we could have a look at the if dev blocks. And specifically, we could have a look at uh, the presence conditions of each line. And so uh, something we could do is similar to statement coverage, we could enforce that we have a, a sample that includes each line exactly, or at least once. Yeah, so uh, every line is included in at least one product from our sample. It doesn't mean it, uh, it, it is executed. Yeah, that depends on the test cases. But we at least have the chance to execute it because in at least one configuration, this statement is actually contained. So and then, um, of course, we can further um, generalize this concept and not only say, OK, we want to have each statement, but uh, we also want to have combinations between statements or code blocks. And this is what we call presence condition coverage. So uh, this means um, we treat the presence conditions as what we did with the, uh, with previously with just the features. And then we say we have combinations between these um, code blocks. And when we, for example, consider three wise presence conditions coverage, so t equals three, then we say we want to have all these eight possible configurations or all these eight possible interactions between three code blocks, which means, okay, we have a product in which all these three code blocks are actually present, yeah? or only two of them are present, or only one of them are present, or none of them are present. Yeah? And this way, we make sure that um, these um, code blocks are in every combination present in at least one configuration, yeah? and then of course, in one product that is derived from these configurations, and then it can be tested and the combinations of these code blocks can be tested. So for example, we have the combination that uh, the variable uh, that we have seen before is declared and is used. We also have the combination that it is not declared and is used, which would lead to a failure. And we also have all the other combinations. Um, it is declared, but never used, which would also be a problem uh, sometimes, right? At least a warning. And if uh, it's never declared and never used, then this is, that would be fine. So presence condition coverage, um, again, um, 
is something that scales for uh, most product lines. So it's similar to um, just plainly T-wise interaction coverage, yeah, which considers just the feature model. But here uh, we consider the actual implementation artifacts, which makes it uh, um, yeah, something that runs in the solution space. So actually considering the code and not only the problem space, which would, uh, would refer to just the T-wise coverage, where we only look at the problem, uh, the problem space, which comes from the feature model and not the code. So as it turns out, when you um, yeah, then use uh, presence condition coverage, you can achieve um, yeah, a different form of coverage, of course, because you're looking now at these code blocks. But it is similar to um, um, this normal TWAS coverage. But you can oftentimes get uh, smaller samples yeah, because you're directly looking at the code and all the potential problems that are there. And so you can uh, create smaller samples. And also, you detect um, errors that were not detectable before, or you can guarantee that you detect these errors yeah, with the right test cases, of course. Um, so because here you guarantee that all of these uh, code blocks are combined with each other. And prior to this, uh, you would only um, yeah, have, uh, for example, three features uh, selected together. But this doesn't, these features may be not directly mapped to a specific code block. But as I said, the presence condition can be arbitrarily complex. And so this skips this part of mapping these features to implementation artifacts, but looks directly at the implementation artifacts, yeah? which then um, gives you a higher detection uh, potential for failures. OK. So what other techniques are there? And for this, uh, I, small to you, uh, I brought to you a small uh, diagram uh, which differentiates between different techniques. So what we already looked at is um, automatic selection of, uh, like this, um, automatic selection of uh, configurations for a sample. And specifically, we looked at a greedy strategy, yeah, which is, uh, for example, ICPL. Um, but of course, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, you don't have to use a greedy strategy. There are also evolutionary algorithms or meta heuristics in general, um, where you can have um, something uh, like this, which doesn't give you 100% uh, uh, T-wise coverage, but a really good uh, sample which achieves a high T-wise coverage. Yeah? Then, of course, uh, you can uh, do other things like uh, manual selection. So this uh, would be uh, what we discussed about uh, sample-based um, testing with configurations uh, um, chosen by experts. So this is also something you can do. And of course, you can have uh, something like a semi-automatic selection uh, where you combine uh, somehow both. So we have a, a tool which guides you through um, uh, the uh, configuration process, um, but still you have some domain expert or uh, other a person who is um, doing some manual work there. And of course, uh, aside from how you actually select your um, configurations, you can also look at what's my coverage criteria. Right? And for uh, now, we already looked at um, a T-wise coverage uh, for feature interactions, yeah, and also pairwise coverage, which is a specialization, and one-wise coverage, which is a other specialization of just T-wise coverage. And what I just showed you is that we also can have coverage for code, like presence condition coverage or statement coverage. And um, this is the other thing that when you do a white box approach that you can then look at uh, for creating your sample. So another thing that is possible is uh, to look at the sampling techniques in terms of their input data. So what data you actually give the sampling algorithm uh, aside from uh, just the feature model. Yeah, of course, you have to provide it the feature model uh, when you want to um, derive valid configurations um, that you can actually build. Uh, but of course, this is only the problem space. So um, yeah, when you look at the feature model. And additionally to the feature model, you can also look at uh, just domain knowledge from uh, your problem space. Yeah, So something like an expert would know like what are configurations that are chosen frequently, uh, what are combinations that are chosen frequently, uh, where is um, high potential for uh, bugs or something like this. It's all domain knowledge that you could somehow incorporate uh, in your um, sampling algorithms when you want to create um, small samples or really effective samples, Yeah, which are capable of detecting uh, or have a high potential of detecting faults. Another thing is, again, you can look at the uh, solution space, um, not only the problem space. And there, of course, the implementation artifacts, like in present condition coverage. Um, you can also have a look at the uh, test artifacts. So again, do something like a control flow analysis, um, or you can have a, a look at the data dependencies and, and so on, and can derive for test cases and also your uh, sample configurations from there. So. 
Another thing um, you can um, look at, or yeah, that we already have looked at in part two is the combinatorial interaction testing. Yeah, here only the feature model is um, is used, and which makes it just a, um, a sampling algorithm which is, uses uh, the problem space. Yeah? And then what I just showed you is that you can also use the implementation artifacts, and then you look at the solution space, where, which is why we call it a solution space sampling. And here again not only uh, the feature model is used, but it's also used in addition. And um, what you use um, then separately is the, yeah, the implementation artifacts, yeah, or in general, the source code of the system. And of course, there are lots of more uh, things that you can do. Um, something you can also consider is uh, using the feature model, but also deriving configurations that may not be built entirely, but only in specific parts. Yeah, and then uh, you can consider, okay, maybe I can um, have uh, some specific configurations that I only want to be uh, executed um, in, in certain areas, so only specific functions or something like this. And with this, I can further reduce the number of uh, unit tests and the number of implementations artifacts that have to be executed. And um, so overall, I reduce the uh, testing effort I have for a system. Yeah, and not, and not only um, creating my configurations, but I don't test every configurations completely. Yeah? Maybe I, uh, it's sufficient to only test uh, configurations in specific parts, yeah? only some functions yeah? so to avoid redundant testing effort. Okay, and that's basically everything uh, for the third part. So what do we have learned? So we had to look at white box testing and how we can incorporate this in um, you know, software product line testing. Um, I showed you how we can cover if dev blocks or presence conditions in general of uh, code blocks and how you can um, yeah, use T-wise presence condition coverage um, when you consider these presence conditions. And um, what I also tried is giving you a small overview uh, over all the different techniques and input values that you have uh, for sampling. So for just creating a sample and you're seeing this uh, is of course, lots of different um, yeah, algorithms that you can use there. And so it's not one solution fits all of course for uh, every system. So for each system, you have to be really careful uh, making some trade-offs, making some design decisions, what you uh, actually use as a technique and what is sufficient um, for testing your system. So when you want to do a bit uh, more reading on these topics, um, yeah, I can um, yeah, recommend these, uh, these three papers. Um, one um, that we talked about, which is similar to statement coverage uh, for software product lines, then the solution space sampling, and also um, yeah, different kind of solution space sampling um, that yeah, um, yeah, it translates the feature model prior to making the presence condition sampling. Okay, and then again, as another practice uh, that you can do um, when you uh, consider uh, the samples that we just created, you can ask also the question, does the ordering of the uh, configurations that we have in the sample any uh, meaningful, um, um, or is it meaningful to reorder these configurations in a certain way? So does this matter or is it um, actually, um, yeah, something that we don't have to consider? So you can think about that. Um, what could be advantages, disadvantages of having specific orders of your configurations there. Yeah, and maybe you can also have a look at the paper that is already uh, linked here. Okay, then that's all for today's lecture. Uh, yeah, have a nice day, evening, whatever time it is uh, at your end and bye-bye.